continue. Continue. Okay. So you can start now. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, uh, afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Klukum for this semester. It's my great uh, uh, honor um, to introduce today's speaker, Professor Stanley Osher. Professor Osher holds uh, professorships at UCLA in mathematics, computer science, electrical engineering, and chemical and biomolecular engineering. He's director of the special projects at the Institute for the Peer and Applied Mathematics at UCLA. He received the Gauss Prize at the 2014 ICM meeting, which is the highest award for applied mathematicians. He also received the Rob E. Clemen Prize from the SIEM, as well as many other awards for his contributions, bridging engineering and high level mathematics. He was elected in uh, National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Currently, he had over 140,000 citations, according to the Google Scholar. So he ranks around 58 in the world among all scientists. Mm. Now let's welcome Professor Stanley Osher. Okay, I would I would say it's nice to be here, but I'm, I'm in my home, so you know uh, I'm not going to say that. Anyway, we're going to talk about uh, a report I gave to the Air Force. This is a, a smaller version of it. Uh, it's joint work with many many people, including uh, Wu Chen, who played a big role in all this stuff. Uh, he basically taught me mean field games uh, a year a year a couple of years ago, and uh, I am hooked on it. Okay, next slide, please. Mean field games. The optimal control of population behavior is uh, important in optimal transport and mean field games. Uh, it, it refers to a control problem in density space. You minimize the running cost of a population uh, such that there's constraints on the evolution of population dynamics. So for example, lower left over here, you can see these dots uh, rotating. And in the, on the, down below, you can see, and you'll, still, you'll, still, you'll soon see things moving. Uh, these these uh, tufts of smoke, which represent densities, are going to move, move across and avoid these obstacles. So mean field games are uh, some kind of uh, control problem, essentially. Uh, or, uh, but you're basically looking at densities. Uh, and it's a very important subject with many, many applications. And uh, we'll talk about it. Basically, we're going to talk about numerical aspects of it uh, with a little bit of theory. Okay, uh, next. Okay, so this is the most complicated slide you're going to see. So be calm, it's not that hard. Uh, the first equation uh, is the Hamilton Jacobi equation, where it, so it's phi t plus h of grad phi, but it also includes density, so it's coupled and uh, it has viscosity. So it's a Hamilton, it, there's a Hamiltonian in there, uh, which depends on the gradient, but also the density is moving along at the same time. And, and that's the second equation, which is a factor of Hogy lehet ezen hangot csinálni? Sorry? Excuse me? Is everybody here? What happened? Yeah, please mute yourself. Yeah, you could, if you have any question, you can ask. Yeah, okay, no worry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, was there a question? Uh, no, this is not the question. It's maybe if you forget to mute. Yeah. Continue. Okay, very good. Okay, so density is positive and uh, not negative. It's a probability distribution. It's, 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 it's normalized. Integral density is one. Uh, there's boundary conditions at capital T on density and zero on a phi. Uh, phi will turn out to be a Lagrange multiplier associated with. Uh, a, an optimization problem, and it, it, it encloses the constraints. Uh, so you have a Hamiltonian, which is periodic in space and convex in momentum. Uh, sigma is diffusion, which is viscosity. Uh, phi zero is given, and, uh, and most of T are given terminal initial conditions, and th this is a coupled system, uh, which can involve many, 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 many dimensions, because it's a control problem, and you can have lots of controls, lots of constraints as we will see. Okay, next please. Uh, so this is the first, I'm gonna split this up into a whole bunch of different talks. 
and don't be afraid to ask questions. This is joint work with the whole gang, uh, Lars Rutoto, Wu Chen, Levon, and Sammy Wu Feng. Uh, this is a machine learning framework for high dimensional mean field games, okay? Oops. So this is the original problem. This is a variational formulation for potential mean field games. You minimize this Lagrangian, L or L rho, uh, plus this running uh, density, which is F of rho, plus the boundary conditions, which are in four space away, capital T and G, such that the transport equation is satisfied. Uh, rho T plus del dot rho V equals zero. So our contribution here is to solve these problems in very high dimensions, including 100 dimensions. Uh, and for those of you who know about hamilton jacobi equations a little bit, we're going to use Lagrangian coordinates uh, and also for the uh, transport equation. Uh, there, we, have, we parameterize a potential function. Here, the velocity is minus the gradient of phi. It's not always minus the gradient of phi. We're, we're, we're taking a special Hamiltonian to make it easy. Uh, so the velocity is actually the gradient of uh, Hamiltonian in respect to, to, to uh, um, uh, the, the parameter P, I'll show you in a minute. Okay, anyway, so th this is what we're going to use. Next, please. Okay. So this is Lagrangian-based machine learning formulation. If you solve a Hamilton-Jacobi equation in high dimensions uh, using a grid, it's almost impossible to go beyond, beyond dimension four because there's too many grid points and it takes forever. There's no memory and I mean, not enough memory and so on. So our goal here is to replace the partial differential equation by a system of ordinary differential equations, which is basically the method of characteristics uh, jazzed up to include this case. So uh, we have the Z dt is the, the Z is the velocity and this is gonna be Lagrangian. In other words, we're following particles is what we are doing is equal to minus the gradient of phi. Uh, and it could be any velocity that comes from the Hamiltonian. We're minimizing that quantity up above, which was the original uh, Lagrangian after you transformed. Oh, let's go back one, sorry. Oops, go back, sorry. Uh, we'll, what happened? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so the first two equations are how the thing flows, basically. Uh, the third equation is the optimization uh, the third and fourth, third and th third and fourth equations of optimization. The fifth equation is a constraint uh, uh, equation. This is a system of uh, ordinary differential equations, which is much easier to deal with in high dimensions than a system of partial differential equations. So x can be many, many dimensions, and you can still solve it because ODEs are much easier than PDEs, and you don't need a big grid. So it's completely grid-free. Uh, there's some tricks. Uh, for those of you who care about the details, the Laplacian of phi is used to estimate the determination of the induced transformation. When you solve dz dt is equal to v, uh, x moves, and you have to have some kind of Jacobian associated with it. And uh, there's a formula uh, which includes the Lapl this uh, a Laplacian uh, and this quantity L, so we solve that. And we're going to solve this by using a neural network with weights theta. Okay, now we can go to the next one. But don't forget, we're solving very high dimensions. Uh, the neural network is parameterized a certain way for those of you who care. This is a special shape which works very well when the Hamiltonian is quadratic. Uh, this A plus A transport and so on. So it might be a little special, but we can do more general. Uh, we are looking to find the parameters theta which fit the uh, uh, optimization uh, that we are doing. And uh, we're using what's called a ResNet, which means if you look at the equation four, it looks as though we're solving a PDE back or an ODE backwards. U1 is equal to U0 plus H times something and so on. That looks like uh, Euler's method. And these are called uh, residual networks. This was a big breakthrough about seven years ago when people realized this is a good way of writing uh, uh, architectures for uh, uh, AI type stuff. Okay, next. Uh, so there's some trick, Laplace, this is a technical, Laplacian potential can come from the Hessian. Uh, and that's relatively easy to compute given our, the shape of our uh, architecture. Okay, so I'll skip that. Uh, okay, this is more about uh, the implementation. Um, 
which I will probably skip. It's just the technical details, but it, it, our formulation makes it somewhat easy. Okay, next. Ah, so th this is this is where the rubber meets the road. These are results. Uh, the first column has uh, this is uh, uh, high dimensions. Uh, how many dimensions are we here? I don't know. Uh, it, dimensions go from two to a hundred. Of course, you can't visualize a hundred dimensions. So this is a, a cylindrical shaped thing with a cross section. But we are not using the fact that it's cylinder. We actually solve it uh, as though it was a high dimensional problem. And what you're doing is on the left, you have uh, initial density and on the right is what you want to get to. That's what this uh, row does. Row moves, and this is optimal transport. So there's no, this problem doesn't have any uh, mean field gain in it. It's just shifting, it's earth movers distance, which is mean field gain without the interaction. Uh, so at dimension two, you see uh, all, all, the similar behavior that these bubbles go down to the center uh, and don't go back again as they're supposed to, uh, pretty well in all dimensions. Uh, so we're solving a hundred dimensional problem without killing ourselves. You can, and again, you cannot do this without this uh, idea of using the ODE version of it, which is the uh, um, Lagrangian version. For those of you who know about hamilton jacobi equations, you might be worried, I, I would be in the old days, uh, that these characteristics, these ODEs could have intersecting characteristics, and you get shocks or at least jump derivative for hamilton jacobi But that does not happen for these problems for some fortuitous reason. I mean, you can, it, it's a theoretical result that guarantees that. So you can do this. Okay, so you can see that we go up to 100 dimensions without killing ourselves. Uh, next. Oops. And this is uh, the examples for different dimensions. Uh, you, you, know, you can look at the colors and see uh, what's going on or look at the tables. And N is the uh, number of iterations. And so for 100 dimensions, it's 37,000 uh, basically operations, which is about what it would be in four dimensions or three or four dimensions if you did a uh, uh, Eulerian, which means uh, grid-based rather than what we're doing. And the thing we're trying to minimize gives you the same results, L and G, uh, it was small errors, uh, and, and the uh, constraint, and the time does not, is uh, not completely outrageous. 100 dimensions is not so slow, it, it's, it's getting there. It, uh, but it's still something you can do in, in, in a few hours. And this is not a regular, this is not on a supercomputer. Okay, very good. So this shows the stuff, the method works. Let's go next, please. Uh, this is a, what we did is run a two-dimensional example on a grid uh, and compare it to what we did. Uh, so uh, you can see the, uh, the, grand, the second and third columns, the Grangian uh, is what, what we just did and Eulerian is a, is a differential equation version on a grid and they are close. Uh, and the same thing is true uh, for uh, the guy on the right. Uh, where you move these things uh, back and forth. And the characteristics, for example, down below look uh, pretty good in the lower right. That means it, that the, the, the thing travels in the right directions, even though we're very high dimensions. And we get the same results as the Lagrangian version, and supposedly ours are more accurate, even in the low dimensional case. Okay, so there's some references. There's a PNAS, next one, sorry. There's a PNAS, uh, 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 article preceding National Academy of Science. We can look at the next reference page, maybe. Okay. Next. Okay. So yeah, with uh, uh, a lot, this is joint work with a lot of interesting people, most of whom were attached to UCLA in one way or another. Uh, and uh, I'm going to follow up with the, the fifth uh, reference down below, which is a related problem. So that that's coming next. Okay. That takes care of that. Next thing is another high dimensional result, uh, alternating the population and aging control networks. Uh, the lead author is Alex Lynn, who's a smart young kid. Uh, the rest of it is, you know, the Sam is, is also a postdoc. Uh, in fact, there, there are four postdocs up, up there and me. Wu Chen's no longer a postdoc. Okay, work on this. Okay, next. 
Okay, so this is as though you didn't, I mean, I should have done this in the beginning. A mean field game models the behavior of a very large number of small interacting agents that each one is optimized their own value function. So here are these sheep, sheep kind of move in an efficient way. Okay, next. Uh, so here is the math mathematics of it, which is similar to what you saw before. Uh, the equilibrium solution can be found by over, uh, minimizing an energy. Uh, it's the integral of a rho times this, uh, which is the density, times this Lagrangian, uh, which depends on velocity, uh, plus this interaction term, f of x rho, plus a boundary condition at, at, x, at uh, capital T. And the optimization has a constraint, one more time, rho T plus delta rho V, this time there's viscosity. So this, this has a stochastic aspect. aspect. Uh, the minus nu, okay. So this is a slight, this is a different problem, but it's in, in a similar spirit, but we're gonna solve it differently. And uh, particularly you can't use Lagrangian coordinates because you have this viscosity term and it's no longer true that things propagate along characteristics. Uh, there's a stochastic aspect. Okay, next please. Uh, so by using, uh, uh, KKT conditions then integration you wind up with this min max problem uh, as you can see um, and you're maximi minimizing over row maximum over phi which means you end up with a sampling problem and then an ingenious idea which is basically due to Alex I think uh, you turn rho and phi into neural networks and train it as generalized generative adversarial networks so next slide uh, they're called GANs. Uh, rather than read the equations, the basic idea, well, training has, you, when you're doing GANs, you have a discriminator and a generator. The generator produces samples and the discriminator evaluates the quality of these samples. Uh, and there's a, it's a min-max problem. And many of you are, may have seen this stuff where you take, uh, where you generate pictures of celebrities who, who are not human beings, they don't exist. You take data, uh, and you uh, uh, generate, uh, and then the discriminator evaluates the quality of these samples and puts together a totally new human being uh, who looks like something realistic coming from the original uh, set that you're sampling. So you have these fake images and so on. But the beautiful fact is that this problem we just wrote down uh, is a complete analog, is a new way of doing this training. Okay, and uh, I'll talk about how to do it in a minute. Okay, next. So you turn it into a min-max problem, uh, and you, you can turn you can express it in uh, expectation form, and it looks very, very much like the uh, uh, problem that you of Gans. Okay, so that, that's the observation. So you solve this uh, optimization and look for a saddle point. Okay, next. Uh, this, is, this is a propaganda. Uh, this is the first uh, paper that solved high dimensional stochastic mean field games. Uh, you don't need to discretize space one more time. Uh, stochastic means we added viscosity. Uh, you only need to solve for the trajectories the way, the way we did it. Uh, next. So here's an numerical result, which is kind of fun. Uh, there's, a, there's this quantity nu, which is uh, the viscosity. When nu equals zero, it's deterministic. You march ahead and there's nothing random. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get this blue stuff over past these two obstacles. It's a hundred dimensional problem. And when nu equals zero, you march along the right way. You can, it's not, there's no fog. You can see where to go and you head for the corner over there and you do it in a very efficient way when new is positive it's stochastic and you're and you're bumbling around in this fog fog uh so you you go towards the right direction but not until you get close to you do something reasonable and it blurs out and it even fi fights its way through these obstacles which are not transparent which are slightly transparent uh so this this computation is a hundred dimensional pro problem one more time 
and there's an obstacle in the first two dimensions and it's done in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, next. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a mean field game uh, problem rather than uh, a simple obstacle problem. There's a hundred dimensional congestion problem. There's congestions in the first two dimensions. Uh, and the viscosity is zero on the left and something positive on the right. And one more time, you can see on the left, even with the congestion, you aim in the right direction and it's much more efficient. Uh, when uh, the new is positive, you bumble around and you see only a few, a few feet ahead of you because of some kind of uh, fog or smog or something. And uh, you get through, okay. So that's, that's what the congestion term looks like this. Okay, very good. Okay, next. This is a lot of fun. This is nonlinear control affine system. So it doesn't look like mean field games at first, but it's uh, related. Uh, it's done with Karthik and uh, Sitting, who is a student, and Mu Chen and me. Okay, next. Okay, what is it? Uh, you extend the dynamical formulation of optimal transport to control affine systems. You'll see what that means in a minute. First, you establish existence results and control constraints, which I won't go into in too much detail. Then you solve it for a quadratic, uh, for a cost using primal dual hybrid gradient. Uh, and then we use uh, an, an homogeneous degree one distance, which is the L1 distance, which is my favorite distance. If you're moving a pile of sand from point A to point B, you don't square it and take the sum of the squares and take the square root. You just pick it up and push it over. That's L1. So we, numerically, we solve the homogeneous degree of one cost, and that turns out to be a very efficient. Uh, for some reason, you get rid of time. And the problem is therefore pretty fast to solve. Uh, so let's see what the, what the equations look like. Uh, the motivation, I should say, it, it takes swarms of robots from one configuration to another. Every robot it, it goes according to a differential equation. So theta dot is equal to a velocity. Uh, U1, x dot is equal to U2 cosine theta, which makes sense. And x2 is equal to U2 sine theta. These are forward, these are, uh, theta is the turning rate. Uh, a technical challenge is the number of dimensions, number of controls, and dimension of state space. This could be very high dimensions. We have a swarm of robots. Okay. Next. Thanks. Uh, so you take this, uh, op uh, this optimal optimization, you take this fluid dynamical formulation of optimal transport. One more time, everything is subject to the uh, uh, continuity equation, uh, but this time it's rho times G zero and uh, uh, rho times sum of GI. So it's not the full velocity. That is, uh, there's no guarantee, you have to have some constraints which say that you can go, you can transport points uh, from point A to point B. You have a uh, uh, control vector field and you wanna find that optimal control in feedback forms so that the solution satisfies the minimum, uh, sorry, initial and terminal constraints and minimize the expected value of the control. So it looks familiar, but there's a difference as you will see next. Oops. You have to be able, if you solve this equation, you have to be able to, you have to establish the existence of solutions to the optimal transport problem, that you can go from uh, point A to point B, even though uh, the number of the velocity components don't, uh, the GI don't span the space. Uh, but, uh, okay, you, you can be justified. Uh, we extend also the theoretical results before they use linear control and quadratic costs, and now we have things very nonlinear stuff. And I'll show you what that means. Next. So this is the first time you've seen in some detail what optimal transport looks like. Uh, you minimize the integral from zero to t of this what looks like kinetic energy. Uh, such that the, uh, the this conservation equation, whatever you call it, this transport equation holds. Uh, 
and uh, you, you change, you make it into a convex problem by uh, replacing rho u by momentum and uh, density rather than velocity and density. So this is the uh, this uh, thing that we're looking for a saddle, a saddle point for. It looks very familiar, except there are some special cases because the, these g's don't span the space. Uh, <clears throat> as we also use a beautiful trick, which is probably due to my, Matt uh, uh, Jacobs, when there's something called a hybrid gradient algorithm, primal dual hybrid gradient, uh, and that can be slow. And uh, we've developed a method, mostly Matt, the convergence of this crazy thing is independent of the grid size, that which is amazing, the rate of convergence. Uh, so it's very, very helpful for large scale problems. He, he managed to do that by preconditioning, which I won't go into, but it's, it's a beautiful trick. Okay, next. Here we go, so there's the unicycle. Uh, there's initial and terminal distributions of a unicycle model, two different scenarios. Initial on the left, uh, it splits into two parts and different orientations. And, 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 and different orientations. One is parallel, and the second is uh, it turns right and left. So recall the control rate, rate theta dot, or what it looks like is three equations, although they can be higher dimensions. Uh, and we do the so we get next. Okay, aha, uh -huh. okay. So case one is when these guys were pointing to the sides, and that's what happens. This blur, this blur breaks up and goes to the two sides. Uh, in case two, they go straight up, and then they split, and that's that's what that's what this was designed to do. So for those values of the controls, this is what you get, and uh, you can see that it works pretty well. Okay. All right, next. Uh, and just a comment that the, uh, you can see these, uh, maybe you can, I hope you can, you can see these red lines tell you what's going on. These blurs, these guys go that way. Uh, and then the guys in the middle go up and then, then make a sharp right and left turn. Uh, and it's a fast algorithm because we got rid of time and we did the tree conditioning. Okay. Uh, and that's another con uh, control problem, uh, optimal transport type. Okay, next. Uh, here is something a little technical, but it's fun. Uh, computational methods for non-potential. Uh, for those, I mean, this is a little bit advanced. Mean field games usually have uh, these, these functions I mentioned before, F and G are usually the gradients of something. So this entire thing is, is a, uh, uh, gradient descent type problem, core ascent. Uh, this is joint work with Levon, Norbeckian, Sitting, Matt, uh, Matthew, Matt Jacob, and Ruchan, and me. Next. So we started a novel method to solve mean field game system with mixed coupling. That is, you have non-local and local interactions. Usually, mean field games have a separate term of uh, interactions of densities. Uh, this can, has uh, puts it together uh, in a, in a uh, in a more complicated way, which is more reasonable. Uh, it, it uses convex optimizations, kernel methods, and variational mean field game. You can solve non-potential mean field games one more time as a primal dual method pairs of monotone inclusions, and that, from a technical point of view, is new and nice and theoretically justified. And let's look at some pictures. Uh, okay, so here's, I, I should say, here's the equation. What makes this a little bit different from the other stuff that we looked at is uh, you have f, which is a function of the integral of k rho, uh, and g, yeah, uh, is also, uh, which is the valid boundary condition, is also an integral of j, uh, of an uh, integral. Uh, so there are, lots, there are lots of nonlinear interactions, and then there are some local interactions involving F, and that's what we were talking about before. Okay, so this is new technically and interesting. Next. Uh, and here are some examples of what these non-potential mean field game uh, functions look like. I won't go through it very, very often, very, very, very detailed. 
but there's a beautiful idea which is doodle of von Nobeckian before he came to UCLA, but he's cleaned it up a lot and it's really nice. Uh, if you have an integral operator, you expand it in terms of uh, maybe not maybe not eigenfunctions, just functions that capture the interactions. And having done that and replacing K with that expansion, it turns out that the optimization becomes quite simple, which is an amazing observation and very useful. Okay. Next. So here we go. This is maximal spread. Okay. Uh, K of X, Y looks like this. And you have a larger spread in the X1 direction. Uh, okay. These guys move this way and get where they're supposed to go, but they spread out. Okay. Next. Uh, if you have repulsion, uh, you get stronger repulsion in the X1 dimension direction, and these guys can sneak through <laughs> uh, these uh, regions with, uh, with something blocking them. Okay. And here's uh, mixed couplings with static obstacles. And these things move through the uh, hole and, and move around. Uh, and there's a density constraint where X row is zero at the obstacles. Okay. All right, next one, please. And this is my favorite with dynamic obstacles. You have to adjust it so you don't hit these guys. So this is all done by optimization and this modeling uh, in two dimensions. Uh, a good point would be try to, to try to jazz this up to higher dimensions, which we haven't done yet. So this is, these are grid-based calculations. I started out with uh, uh, AI and did some relative, somewhat easier problems, I guess, uh, in high dimensions. And now this is lower dimensions, but uh, there are possibilities of in going higher. Okay. And there's some preprints on this, which uh, by the same group of people. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going down, but I'm going okay. Uh, mean field game inverse problem. Okay. Uh, this is done by uh, Lee Sang Dong, who's a student, and the other three guys. And what we are trying to do is very ambitious indeed. Uh, the mean field game problem can be written this way you minimize this crazy functional, uh, integrate from zero to t. Subject to rho t plus del dot rho v equals zero. This is the forward problem. And you want to, uh, if you want to recover the unknown metric, okay, so before I had rho v squared in the old days in equation one, now we have a metric uh, and a cost functional, and we don't know some of these quantities. Uh, and uh, for example, f of rho, uh, f, f can be. Uh, Integral of rho, k convolved with rho, and we're interested in k. So the idea is we have a mean field game, and we don't and we don't know some of the uh, parameters that are crucial for uh, how the density is going to move. Um, so the idea is to solve this mean field problem, uh, inverse problem. Okay. Next. So rho is the density distribution of the players during the game. V is the velocity field of the agents. Uh, G sub M is a metric function on the sample space, uh, depicting the geometric contour of the transport space. Uh, the convolution kernel, uh, K, dep depicts the in uh, positive impact between the particles, which is, depends on nothing but the relative distance of any two players. Okay. Great, very good, next. So the inverse problem can be written this way. I should explain what these parameters are. You have done a computation uh, and you found rho hat and v hat uh, and rho zero hat and rho, those are the boundary conditions. Uh, and what we're looking for is what was the metric and what was uh, the k the density, the uh, kernel that generated the solution. So you solve the problem and you got these row tildes and row zeros and so on. Theta uh, is related to uh, 
the metric. I should have said that somewhere. The theta, theta is sitting in the metric G sub m, and I'll explain how in a minute. So this is an inverse problem, which is not, which is a very blunt instrument inverse problem. You did one, you did one uh, iteration and got a row V and so on, and you want to get, find out what the true row in V are, and it's subject to row T plus delta rho V equals zero, uh, and the other uh, uh, constraints uh, that arise in this uh, optimal transport problem. Uh, so the objective function is the L2 distance between the density distribution, velocity field, and observations, and an HP uh, norm, this, this term over here, which is my favorite term, gamma over P times grad theta line two, uh, that's the regularization parameter. And the constraints re restrict the solution to satisfy a mean field gain PDE, uh, but this is obviously an ill-posed problem. There are lots of, you know, no one, no one guarantees that if you've done one um, calculation, you have enough information to get back all this other stuff. It turns out if you constrain things enough to do, and what's very interesting to me in this problem is uh, the regularization, gamma times grad theta. And we need that to keep things smooth and to get some kind of unique solution. Uh, and uh, the constraints restrict the position, the, the solution to satisfy the mean field gain uh, PD. Okay. Next. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, reconstruction. We solved the inverse problem with primal dual and Bregman iteration, and we keep your eye on the Bregman iteration. I'll talk about that later. Uh, this is the numerical result we got. The way, the way it's written is uh, the left is learned from the observation, that's G0. Uh, the center is uh, the true G0 bar. And the absolute difference between the two of them is this uh, funny function. So it means that uh, you get about 10 to 15% error, which is not bad for such an ill-prose problem uh, in, uh, in two dimensions also. Uh, okay. So, okay, we solved it this way. Let's, let's talk about how we solved it. Uh, here's a convolution, okay. Uh, here's a convolution kernel we created in two dimensional basis with H2 uh, regularization, uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, from the left is the K of X zero learned from the observation. Uh, the center is the real K and the absolute difference is the one on the right. And again, we get about 15% error, which I think is pretty good given how little information we have. Okay, next. If you have noisy observations, uh, you can see what's going on. The, the first row is for noisy uh, row tilde. The second row, uh, second row is for noisy v, v, v hat. Uh, and that's what the uh, uh, quantities look like. And the, the, the third column is quite noisy. Okay. So what happens when you have noisy observations? And uh, let's do the one D version. Uh, you're trying to re refine that ground metric, which I called theta before, in the one dimensional case. Uh, in each figure, the, the uh, red curve is the, is the learned ground metric, while the blue curve is the real metric. Uh, the noise factor goes from 0.1 up to one. Uh, and gamma goes from 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus three. So, that caught my eye. Uh, we need a different gamma, and the orders of magnitude of gamma are hard to anticipate ahead of time. So this is a, this is a, a usual problem that occurs in uh, inverse problems. When you have an inverse problem, you almost always regularize, and you put gamma times some norm or something like that. And the question is, how big is gamma? And the answer is, who knows? You have to play around to get a good answer. And in this, in this case, we went from 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus three, five orders of magnitude, and we finally got something pretty good. Uh, but you wouldn't know that ahead of time. Okay, uh, next. Uh, okay. 
So here's the difference. This is my favorite part of this paper, although there's a lot of beautiful stuff in there. Uh, we use Bregmanneration. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's um, uh, it's been around. and it, It's related to uh, uh, augmented uh, uh, Lagrangian. Uh, you, re you recreate the metric kernel from a noisy data, but instead of solving for gamma, you 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 have no gamma. You basically have a flow, which takes you from the original uh, um, uh, formulation, the original form of this uh, object, and it moves it along. And so it's much faster. And after a few iterations, you get a pretty good result. Uh, and it's, it took seven iterations rather than the the, the uh, attempts we made to fool around with gamma. That's the top. Uh, uh, top row, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, very good. Okay, the, the last figure, the, the two last figures are interesting. The, la the next to last figure in the first uh, row is what you got from Bregman iteration. Uh, the, the last figure is when you knew what the right gamma would be, and you did some kind of a, some kind of a, a difficult inversion to get it, and the results are very similar. Uh, so first, you have to figure out what gamma is, and then solve that problem. And Bregman finds it for you. Uh, and the same thing is true down below. You get the recreation, and you get the convolution kernel from noisy data in the first eleven iterations. And again, so bottom right, uh, the Bregman guy looks very similar to the best primal dual guy when you get, get the right gamma. So here I'm advertising a new way of doing a wide class of inverse problems, namely, how do you uh, regularize? And the answer is Bregman iteration, and I'll be happy to talk about it later if you want. Okay, next. Ah, okay, so we finished that. And here's the most fashionable uh, thing we worked on. Uh, controlling propagation of epidemics, mean field uh, SIR models uh, with these colleagues, uh, including Wu Jen Li, we haven't mentioned before, and uh, Hamadeen Tam Tambu in the middle, and Si Ting and Wu Chen. Uh, so what we've done is take a model that is used in epidemics, and we made it into a variational problem which involves motion. Okay, so classically, the epidemic model is as follows. This is the so-called SIR model. Susceptible, <laughs> uh, infected, and recovered. There, there are more complicated, interesting models involving death and exposure and so on, but we'll just, then we'll just do this old model. This is nothing, this is not COVID. This is the general model for uh, epidemics. So you have a susceptible that satisfies the SDT is minus B times susceptible. So if you have susceptible, it, de it decays by itself. However, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, sorry, times, what am I saying, times infected. So if that quantity on the right is positive, uh, it decays. Uh, but the IDT, the infected, as, I'm sorry, the SDT should be negative, of course, that's what you want. The IDT is opposite sign, beta SI, uh, minus gamma times the infected. And finally, the, the recovered is, uh, the RDT is gamma times infected. Okay, so these non-negative constants, beta and gamma, re re represent the results of uh, susceptible becoming infected and infected becoming recovered. And this is a very old model and it's still pretty interesting. But this has no distance. This is just uh, a bunch of ODEs when these guys are next to each other and they talk to each other this way. Okay. And this is a 70 year old model, 70 year old model. So there's a spatial version. This is, this is what we introduced uh, along with some other stuff. Uh, the rho dt plus beta, times, instead of rho times i, it's rho, rho times the integral of k of xy uh, rho sub i. And we also have viscosity for randomness and stability. So that's the way the susceptible moves. The infected, which is a dangerous thing, uh, is the rho i dt is minus beta times, uh, instead of just beta times uh, rho i rho s, you have this, again, the same convolution kernel, opposite sign, and gamma times rho i. So uh, gamma is positive, 
and this would make uh, the, in, the, in, the density of infected people increase, that by itself, except there's, uh, there's some help from the other term. Uh, and uh, finally have the recovered satisfies uh, the rho dt minus gamma rho i uh, plus uh, viscosity, so minus viscosity term, whatever. Okay, so k is symmetric positive definite kernel modeling physical dif distancing. And so it's, it's probably a Gaussian. We simplify the problem. Uh, and an integral of k d rho is the exposure to infectious agents. And we put that in there, first of all, because it's physically reasonable. Second of all, it stabilizes this problem a lot and makes it much more well posed. And if you're curious, the answer is no, we have not really proven too much about this. Uh, we don't know whether this uh, has, a, has a maximum principle, for example, if the rows start all positive, they stay positive. We haven't proven it, it seems to be true. Uh, and there's a few other uh, things that have not been proven, namely existence, uh, or sorry, more like behavior. Okay, anyway, so, that, that's, so what we've done is introduced x, y in this. And what we're trying to do is minimize the energy associated with uh, rho i, which is the density of infected people. So it's e of rho i plus the, the amount of uh, work it takes to go from zero, to go from zero to capital T and to move this guy, these guys uh, somewhere, okay? So it's, uh, and, uh, you're summing over all i's and you have this uh, sum of rho s, the, the uh, three rows. And this is subject to this uh, system of constraints, which were written down before. So one more time, this k is a positive definite symmetric convolution kernel. This was used before, but not in this context. I mean, it was not used together with motion. We have the rho dt plus k plus del dot rho v. We have a velocity field. So our big thing here is velocity. Where do you go? If you're living in LA as I am, do you pack up and move to uh, Canada or something? It's too late, I should have done it. But uh, that tells you whether you should do that or not, depending on whether you're safer where you are or you're safer moving away. And so this involves motion of densities. And this is supposed to predict what you do, for example, uh, when uh, uh, you open schools and see what happens. Okay. So this is, this is a new part of what we did, actually. Next. So let m equal rho v, which is what you do to convexify this thing a little bit. Uh, and you have this Lagrangian uh, plus these uh, constraints, this phi I, these phi i's are Lagrange multipliers. So using this Lagrangian formulation, we do an inf soup and we converge this minimum. This is, we've done this about four times in this, in my talk today. I mean, this is a, our workhorse for solving problems in low dimensions, this primal dual uh, uh, method for attacking saddle points. But here we have no kind, we don't have much convexity. We have no guarantee that it works, but it does work. And what's annoying in this, the way we did it over here is that convolution kernel uh, has to be inverted and that's slow. But recently uh, it's fast. This is, we used, there's a trick uh, that makes this into O of N rather than N log N, but I'm not gonna talk about that here because it's new. So this is what, what you do. Uh, you update row, uh, momentum and fees, the three rows, uh, by using this primal dual hybrid gradient due to Chambol Pock, and uh, it's very useful. Uh, and again, it's a little the way we did it here is a little slow because of that convolution, but it's much faster now, so I'm optimistic people will use it. And let's see what it does. Okay, okay, so. Small recovery rate means gamma down. Okay, gamma is small. Uh, so you see on the left, susceptible uh, in the middle is infected, on the right is recovered, it was nobody. And then when you start marching in time, you're told to leave town. You can see that the way these guys are leaving that 
black region. Uh, so when, when, when gamma is small, you're not gonna recover if you sit there. You're more likely to recover if you get away. And that's what this thing shows you. I should be I, honest, we're not doing, this is not real data. We're just uh, making this up, but we're gonna do it with real data, I think, eventually. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's on the way, okay. Uh, next. Large recovery rate, aha. Large recovery rate says, stay where you are. Uh, you're living in a nice place and it, you're, you're more likely to uh, uh, recover if you stay where you are. You can see on the right, uh, the recovery uh, starts getting some color and uh, susceptible goes down. Okay, so it does what it's supposed to do, but it does complicate it. This is easy because they're circles, but it can give you complicated geometries. All right. Uh, and here's a small recovery rate. Is this a video? I forgot. Yeah. Uh, that's right, one more time. Small recovery rate means get away. And you see this black thing and, and it's moving over to uh, uh, the center. And there's no uh, recovery, a very small recovery. Okay, so uh, is there another slide I don't remember? Next, maybe. Okay, so the moral of the story is uh, we think that these uh, models should have more geometry in them and allow things to move uh, given what the recovery rate is in different parts of the world. Uh, you can go beyond the SIR, as I had said before. Uh, you can construct real geometry, the airports, trains, uh, hospitals, schools. And one thing you might mention, it might ask is what are these numbers, beta, gamma, and the, the variance of the uh, kernel? And the answer is we don't know. So we, what we should do is an inverse problem based on real data. Uh, and eventually we want to do high dimensions. So we, we can control mean field game models with AI and machine learning, including what we just talked about before. Uh, and that is pretty good timing. That's, that's perfect, that's the end of my, is there another slide? I don't remember, no. Okay, well thank you, that's, that's the end of my talk and feel free to ask questions. <laughs> okay. I covered a lot of stuff without too much detail, but uh, I'm happy to uh, discuss. Any questions? Um, maybe I have a question. Yeah. Stan, you hear me? This is Wolfgang. Okay, hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, I, I've had better day. I've had better uh, lifestyles, I'll tell you. <laughs> you are in good company. Yeah. Anyway, so was was great very impressive let let me let me ask you on this first part in the high dimensional regime yeah so you say you the, these these um, these problems involving the hamilton jacobi equations became tractable because you follow the characteristics the one the, the one i started out with yes, yes. so so that, that that was a that was a crucial part to have these lagrangian coordinates but when you're in high dimensions there are potentially many paths to follow. So where is the, the, the complexity of this high dimensional case must be hidden somewhere. Yeah, then the oh, there must date. be something benign on the problem that say if you follow only a few characteristics, that you still get away with good results. And and how how quantitative can you make this? Uh, it seems to work. I mean you I mean you could be right that these these Z of XTs could spread out spread apart and be very thin yeah. in some region, dense in other regions. Uh, but the problems that we have tried, it seems to work. And the, the dimension is governed by the initial data, period, X. So the number of Xs you have. So, okay, yeah, yeah. but, but okay. So, so there, there must be hidden sparsity in, in, in your data already, which, which you then transport along the characteristics. Is that yeah, we don't, need, uh, we don't need sparsity. The fact that it's zero or not zero is not relevant. We need to run the cut integ integration and patience is what we need uh, and back propagation. So the act, no, it's, it's basically solving a high dimensional system of ordinary differential equations, which you can do in a hundred dimensions. Uh, and, you know, uh, back propagate and uh, compute all the gradients and do what you need until it converges. So there's no, no, no sparsity. 
Uh, they could be sparse in the example. The examples I showed were cheating because they were they were sparse uh, in high dimensions. But in principle, it wouldn't matter. Wait, wait. It might actually it might slow down the convergence. I don't know. We have to be honest. We haven't tried it as extensively as we should. Uh, but uh, it's just a bunch of ordinary differential equations that you evolve, uh, and they're coupled, and then you fit parameters to them, and then you do back propagation and it's all over again. Uh, and you get things like this. Yeah, you're right. The examples I showed, those blue examples, there's a lot, that stuff is zero in the middle. Uh, so that, that helps. Uh, but the 100 dimensional problem, we treated like a 100 dimensional, 100 dimensional problem. So it had a lot of, it had a lot of points. Um, there's a table to how many points there are. The, the, fact, the fact that you can train your networks reliably. Yeah. Is, is very much due to the fact that you use this, uh, that you almost are di discretizing a dynamical system. So the resonance. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we, we are, basically. Yeah, yeah. It is other stuff, there are constraints galore, but yes, we're, we're uh, discretizing a dynamical system, precisely. So, but not discretizing a PDE. That's right. And, but but how, how much can you stretch the step size in this thing? So somehow the nonlinearity in the network should compensate for a smaller, a smaller step size, right? To be, answer, to, be, to be honest, I don't know. But if you look at the numbers, uh, it took, uh, you know, it took 36, uh, 37,000 uh, points to resolve this thing, uh, which is not a lot compared to a... Uh, that's right. Yeah, uh, so that's pretty good for 100 dimensions. Uh, so we haven't tested the limits, I don't know. And you're right about step size and all those kinds of stuff. This is early. This is work that has not been uh, nailed down to really complicated cases yet. I see. And it, and it should be. I mean, and I didn't even tell you that the Hamiltonian we're using is a special case. It's uh, uh, what my favorite Hamiltonian. What's his name? Uh, uh, Burgess. <laughs> Burgess equation. <laughs> it's, it, it's m squared. Yeah. So that, that's why the velocity was equal to uh, m or grad phi. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. if we had a more complicated Hamiltonian, we may have to have a different parameter. The parameterization was tailored to that Hamiltonian and, and made it helpful. So we, we did a lot of cheating, but we did a hundred dimensions. That's not bad. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot more to be done. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be talking to Wood Chen a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He loves to talk. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, my pleasure. Any other questions? People usually ask something about COVID, but nobody is. Okay, don't ask. You know. They don't uh, want to know. Yeah, <laughs> they're probably right. I mean, whatever we do, politics intervenes. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking like women test the, the data here in USA, you know, to like we have a spatial like, for campus is easier. Maybe you can test our data. I mean, using, I don't know whether we have data in USA now for, for this commerce. But uh, if we have, we can predict what happens. Like, we should, we should there's data go over. But the first, the first thing we should do if we ever do it is, is try to compute the uh, parameters based on the data, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, that's an inverse problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, we're the first people to include velocity, uh, you know, include motion, and include optimal transport mm -hmm. uh, in this crazy problem. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it goes, it, it has nothing to do with, and then the referee wrote, wrote back a nice thing, but it had nothing to do with COVID, and he's right. It's true for any epidemic, mm -hmm. just the parameters change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, for COVID, okay. would you would you have to incorporate some sort of a delay recogni uh, recognition mechanism, something like that? And probably to make it realistic, or the, yeah. you know, these things happen all the time. Before, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the uh, original SIR model was totally instantaneous. You just yeah. multiply, you, you just yeah. multiply the exactly. So we we at least put a convolution in there and slow it down a little bit. Right. But yeah, I mean, th this is step one, but I think it's, it's kind of nice to introduce uh, velocities and densities moving around in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. That was the main point. Okay, well, thank you guys.
Yeah. Thank you. This was, this was fun. <laughs> uh, okay, stay safe, everybody. You too. Take care. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Right. No questions? Okay. Yeah. Now, well, thanks for his also again for his nice talk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. See you guys. I hope I see you guys in person someday. <laughs>